Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 1, and then Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 16. So first of all, Matthew chapter 1, which is on page 973 of the Church Bibles. So that's Matthew chapter 1, starting at verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, and Judah the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, and Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Aminadab, and Aminadab the father of Nashon and Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Rahab, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. And now Matthew chapter 28, which is on page 1007 of the Church Bibles. So that's Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The second reading is from Ruth chapter 4, which can be found on page 269 of the Church Bibles. That's page 269. And Ruth chapter 4, beginning of verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there. And behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And he took ten men of the elders of the city and said, sit down here. So they sat down. Then he said to the Redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it here, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But you will not tell me that I may know, for there's no one besides you to redeem it, and I come after you. And he said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in in his inheritance. Then the Redeemer said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I impair my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. Now, this was the custom in former times in Israel concerning redeeming and exchanging. To confirm a transaction, one drew off his sandal and gave it to the other, and this was the manner of attesting in Israel. So when the Redeemer said to Boaz, buy it for yourself, he drew off his sandal. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Chilion and to Malon. Also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Malon, I have bought to be my wife to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of this native place. You are witnesses this day. Then all the people who were at the gate and the elder said, we are witnesses. May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. And may your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. 
So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went in to her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. The woman said to Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. He shall be to your restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age, for your daughter-in-law who loves you, who is more to you than seven sons, has given birth to him. Then Naomi took the child and led him on her lap and became his nurse. For the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. They named him Obed. He was the father of Jesse, the father of David. Now these were the generations of Perez. Perez fathered Hezron, Hezron fathered Ram, Ram fathered Aminadab, Aminadab fathered Nashon, Nashon fathered Salmon, Salmon fathered Boaz, Boaz fathered Obed, Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David. So Henry and Amy, Charles and Olwen, those are the names of my four grandparents, all of whom who had died before I was born. When it comes to my great, great, great grandparents, there were 32 of them, presumably, but I don't know any of their names. I don't know if they have the great privilege of being Welsh, as I am. In fact, I don't know a single thing about them. Did they even exist? Well, I guess they must have done, because I'm here. But otherwise, who knows? I may have no great-great-great-grandchildren, but whether I do or don't, so let's say some 150 years into the future, well, will it matter anyway? Not to those great-great-great-grandchildren, but to me. The atoms that currently constitute my body will then be spread far and wide across the universe. Will anyone then know that I even existed? Will my life matter? Will anyone know my name? And likewise for each of you. Well, a man named Elimelech lived and died some 3,000 years ago. He had two sons, Malon and Kilion, but they died childless. Naomi and Ruth and Boaz, they also died long ago. Now, yes, we know these individuals, we've heard of their names because of this ancient short story that's been preserved for us. But still, do those individuals matter? And if so, why? So we come this afternoon to our fourth and final installment in the book of Ruth. Do you remember where we left it last week? We'd looked at Ruth's daring nighttime encounter with Boaz. Do you remember she asked him to be his wife? But the context was she was asking, well, really challenging him to be her redeemer. That is to provide for her and for others in the wider family, to give them an inheritance for the future. And we saw that Boaz was willing, but it wasn't quite straightforward. Seemingly unbeknown to Ruth, there was a, what's called a closer relative, a nearer redeemer than Boaz. And he was first in line to be able to take on this role of redeemer. Just to remind us, look back to chapter 3 and verse 13, where Boaz is saying to Ruth, Remain tonight and in the morning if he will, and in the morning if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. So the question we were left with at the end of last week was, who will redeem? Or even, we might ask, what's his name? That brings us to the events of the following morning as described in chapter 4. And first, we now see the cost of redemption, the cost of redemption. So chapter 3, remember, in private, dead at night. But how will the desires, the intentions expressed then fare in the cold light of day? Well, we're now at the gates of Bethlehem. This is a public place. And here is where agreements were made and ratified. We find Boaz. We find the nearer relative, first in line to redeem, also there, and 10 elders of the city. So the scene is set, all are in place. And now Boaz speaks in verse 3. 
Then Boaz said to the redeemer, Naomi, who has come back from the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. Well, throughout this book, we've seen, haven't we, that names matter. And it comes all the more we're going to find in this chapter. So do pay attention to every name that we are going to hear mentioned. So here it's Elimelech, the first name we heard in the book. But as soon as we heard his name, remember, he died. But if you like, still he had a presence over the whole book. What of Elimelech? What of his name? What of his inheritance? But then here, Boaz is asking this nearer relative, will he purchase the land being sold by Naomi that was from Elimelech to secure that inheritance for this man and family? And the response comes there at the end of verse 4. The nearer relative says, I will redeem it. At which point we are crushed, aren't we as readers? This we don't want to hear. This is not meant to happen. We are rooting for Boaz and Ruth. That's the way it's meant to work. And that's how it's meant to play out. And yet we should realise this decision doesn't really come as a surprise. Just think, if you like, because this is what the Nero Redeemer was thinking, of the financial side of it. Yes, he would have to take on this land and pay a charge for it. And with that would come Naomi. But we know that she's a fairly elderly lady. Let's be honest, how much can an elderly lady eat? But then also he knew she was clearly too old to have any children, which was good for him because that meant no more offspring. And what's more then, when Naomi died, well, there'd be no one else to inherit the land. So then the land would be his and for his children forever. So that is a worthwhile investment. It makes sense. And so he accepts. So at this point, Ruth, if she was aware of it, obviously her hopes would be dashed. But all is not yet lost because Boaz does have another card to play, which comes in verse 5. Then Boaz said to the nearer relative, The day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth, the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. Well, first of all, notice there what Boaz says is the purpose of this redemption. Now, of course, Naomi and Ruth had to be taken care of, but it was also to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. I know that's a mouthful, but we get the gist. It's about the dead. It's about the inheritance it's about their name. But Boaz is telling this nearer relative he has to take Ruth into account, that the land comes with responsibility for her as well. And you can see, can't you, that very much changes the offer that is on the table. And so the nearer redeemer responds there in verse 6, I cannot redeem it for myself lest I impair my own inheritance Take my right of redemption yourself, for I cannot redeem it. So let's just work out, what is the problem? Simply the cost. Think about it. Because with Ruth in the mix, he would have to rewrite his household budget. Because for a start, he'd have to provide not only for Naomi, but for Ruth as well. And then, of course, Ruth was younger. And he'd be obliged with Ruth to have offspring. No doubt, hungry offspring who would eat plentifully. And then, of course, but where would all this end? Well, when this nearer relative died, well, Elimelech's land would then go to Ruth's sons. And if you like, the nearer relative would lose out on it, and his offspring would have their inheritance cut down and would suffer. And so, understandably, this nearer relative says, no thanks. He turns down the offer. We, the readers, breathe a huge sigh of relief. We're back on track. And now to confirm that, next comes this little bit that's quite strange to us with the sandal. But we're told what it means. It confirms the transaction, if you like, publicly. That redemption has taken place in front of witnesses, And now we know the Redeemer is Boaz. And Boaz gives an acceptance speech 
Look down to verse 9. Then Boaz said to the elders and all the people, You are witnesses this day that I have bought from the hand of Naomi all that belonged to Elimelech and all that belonged to Kilion and Mahlon. And also Ruth the Moabite, the widow of Mahlon, I have bought to be my wife, to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance, that the name of the dead may not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his native place. You are witnesses this day. Well, again, did you notice all those names Boaz packs in to those sentences? And there's one in particular, maybe, that we are made, meant to sit up and take notice. It'd be easy to miss the significance of this, but look at the beginning of verse 10. Ruth was the widow of Mahlon. Now, we weren't told that back in chapter 1. We weren't told which one of Mahlon and Kilion was Ruth's husband. We might even have been led to think it was the other. But now we're told it's Mahlon. It's him. It's his name that matters. But why would the author now choose to highlight Mahlon's name and remember it? Well, we can't be sure. But maybe this is a suggestion that back in Moab, Mahlon was the one who spoke to Ruth about the Lord God of Israel. That's why Ruth wanted to come back with Naomi to Judah. That is, Mahlon was a true believer in the Lord. And so now he is remembered. His name matters. But Boaz's Moaz, main point, of course, in this speech is, it's done. The deal is signed off. Boaz has delivered on what he promised to do. And so the land is his, Naomi is his, but especially, so is Ruth. Now, we did this last week, but at this point, let's just take a pause to think, why did our writer write in the way that he did? And I think in particular, you might think, well, why did we get all this detail about that nearer relative? Because after all, we all just wanted Ruth and Boaz to get together, to get married, and that's what's going to happen. So why couldn't the writer just simply cut to the chase and tell us that? Why these intervening verses? The cost. Because without these intervening verses, it might have been easy for us to assume that it was easy for Boaz to be the redeemer. As if he could just have decided in the middle of the night he wanted to do it, and then with no complications or trouble at all, he could have just done it. But actually, no. There was a right way to go about this, a necessary way to go about it. There were responsibilities which Boaz had to accept because redemption is costly. So that's the cost of redemption. Next, we see the fullness of redemption, the fullness of redemption. Because, of course, we're not quite out of the woods yet. Because remember, actually, Ruth was married to Mahon for 10 years, and there were no offspring, which might suggest Ruth was barren. What now? Well, verse 13. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife. And he went into her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bore a son. Well, happy days. A son is born. And notice the writer chooses here to highlight this is from the Lord. Did you notice this is only the second time in the whole book that we've been told explicitly that the Lord has been at work? Remember, it was early in chapter 1 that the Lord, we were told, sent food to relieve that famine in Judah. So beginning and end. But we have seen reading this book that the author's point all the way through is that it's all taken place because it's been the Lord's doing, that God has always been at work for his people's good. And this son now, we know, is not just for Ruth, but also for Naomi. Look at what she is told at the beginning of verse 15. He shall be to you a restorer of life. Or to put it literally, he shall return your life to you. Again, if you were here three weeks ago, that will remind us of chapter 1. Do you remember that word return, or we could say repent, was a key word used 12 times. Do you remember what we saw there? Orpah returned to Moab, to her people, whereas Ruth, the Moabite, returned to Judah. 
We also saw that Naomi returned to Judah, although Naomi sounded pretty bitter about doing that. Well, I wonder sometimes today when we repent, when we listen and do what we know is right to serve the Lord, do we feel that we are missing out as if God is taking away? Well, we've seen, haven't we, that is how Naomi felt deeply. But here we're being told God is the one who restores life. That is, if we repent, if we return, turn to the Lord, as Naomi did, then the Lord will return true life to us. So we will never miss out, ultimately, at all. Quite the opposite. As we repent, and no matter how we feel as we are doing so, we are always gaining even life itself. And we see more of what this means for Naomi in verse 16 and 17. Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. What a turnaround for Naomi. So remember chapter 1, Naomi was undoubtedly in dire straits. She'd lost her husband. She'd lost her sons. So therefore she was destitute as a widow. No food, no future, empty. Well, not that anyone can be utterly empty if they know the Lord, but that is certainly how it felt to Naomi. But then if you see the progression through the book, do you remember chapter 2 in the fields, there was food which found its way to Naomi. She was filled up with what she needed to eat. Then do you remember chapter 3, again at the end of the chapter, there was more food again for Naomi, but this time it was a down payment of yet more to come. And now here we are in chapter 4. Naomi has her hands full, quite literally, with a son. That is not a natural physical son of hers but a son in that he was the one who would give her a future there's more to just realize from the way our author is concluding this account remember again back in chapter one that Naomi spoke to the women of the town about her name do you remember she said don't call me Naomi because that name means pleasant or the pleasant one Naomi said instead call me Mara which means bitter. We saw how Naomi was resentful towards the Lord. But now in these chapters, we've seen how the Lord in his kindness has filled Naomi up. He has restored, returned her life. And again, now Naomi is with the women of the town and they now model to Naomi the response that should surely follow. Verse 14, they say, blessed be the Lord. Now, that should have been Naomi's response all along. But even when all she could bring herself to do was to grumble, well, the Lord is so gracious and so kind. He continued to give her so much, to give her all that she needed and more. And so now she should, with gladness, say, blessed be the Lord. And of course, these words of the women of the town are for us as well. Even maybe after we've read this book, we have seen again our Lord and his kindness and his goodness. So our response should be to want to praise him for it. We thought in chapter one how sometimes we feel a bit like Naomi. But if we still think God is a bit stingy sometimes, if we think maybe God has gone AWOL from our lives, if we still think actually we need to just go the world's way, if we're going to have the future that we want. Well, this book has challenged us. Look again. Look again at the Lord and what he is like. And then because of what we see, return, repent. Return to the Lord because he is good and he is generous and he is kind and he does care and he is at work, even if we can't quite see it, for our good, he gives life. Blessed be the Lord. So we've seen the cost of redemption, the fullness of redemption. 
third, the name of the Redeemer. Well, we're thinking about names and their significance, but there's more. Look back again to chapter 1, and as I read it again, think names. Chapter 4, verse 1. Now Boaz had gone up to the gate and sat down there, and behold, the Redeemer of whom Boaz had spoken came by. So Boaz said, turn aside, friend, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. Well, did you notice three times in that one verse, Boaz is named. And then you might ask, what's the name of that nearer relative? Clearly, Boaz knows and the author must know as well. But we don't find it. Notice first, he's described as the redeemer, although ironically, he turns out not to be. But then look how Boaz addresses him. He says, turn aside, friend. Or as the old King James Version has it, ho, such a one. Trying to convey the point that there is no name. It's not given. And in fact, in this chapter full of names, he never gets a name. Here we are left none the wiser as to what he is called. Why is that? Well, let's just think about this man. Do you remember, all we really know about him is that he didn't take up the offer to redeem because he didn't want to imperil his own inheritance. He thought it wasn't worth it financially. And he was right, we might say. The worldly, sensible solution was not to redeem. Which again, remember we saw that parallel in chapter one where Orpah, the worldly sensible solution was to go back to Moab. But you see the irony where this man's decision has left him. He did everything he could to try and hold on to his own inheritance. But look where he's left. Without a name, without an inheritance, with no future. And instead, the Redeemer, named repeatedly, is Boaz. And in case we'd missed the point, look what gets said at the end of verse 11, where those at the gate say, end of verse 11, to Boaz, may you act worthily in Ephrathah and be renowned in Bethlehem. Um, That is, be renowned, your name known. Which, of course, is exactly what has happened to Boaz and his name, not just in Bethlehem, but now around the world ever since. And yet, we then discover Boaz is not the Redeemer. It's meant to be a bit confusing. We're meant to be thinking about this. Listen again to what the women say to Naomi in verse 14. Blessed be the Lord who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in Israel. So whose name then is it to be renowned in Israel as the Redeemer? Well, it's not actually Boaz. Look down to verse 17. And the women of the neighborhood gave him a name saying, a son has been born to Naomi, they named him Obed. Notice that repetition again of name. And they are talking about Boaz's son, Obed. He is now the redeemer in view. So Naomi has lost two sons in Moab. She now has this son who will provide as redeemer. But no sooner have we seen that, that again we find Obed is not the focus for long. I mean, that would be a really good way to end the book, but our author goes on. Notice, he wants us to keep looking forward. End of verse 17, Obed was the father of Jesse, the father of David. And then those closing verses, 18 to 22, more names to show us that. The line from Judah and Perez, which includes Boaz and Obed, really does lead us to David. What's the significance of David? Well, do you remember the opening line of the book? That this all took place in the day of the judges, those days when there was no king in Israel. And so chaos ensued as everyone simply did as they saw fit. Well, we could say more precisely there was no human king. Do you remember Elimelech's name, what it means literally? My God is king. And some might have thought as we started this book, well, okay, but it doesn't look like that 
in Israel. But the book of Ruth has shown us the Lord God is king, always. And the way God works that out is by giving Ruth and Boaz and Obed steps along the way until God would give his people a human king, David. And as we learn about David, we discover he really did deliver more, if you like, on a much wider scale than Boaz did. He defeated the enemies of God's people and he brought them security and provision. He was, in that sense, a redeemer. But then again, we would say, well, at least he did for a time and to a degree. Well, not all was rosy during David's reign. And of course, David died. And so David now also could not provide this lasting inheritance. David was a great king, but not the ultimate solution. Do you see how our writer in Ruth has almost got our hopes up and yet not given us the solution with this talk about name and inheritance and a future. And yet even the positive characters he gives us can't deliver Boaz or Obed or even David. But of course, the author has, if you like, pointed us where to look. He's pointed us down that inherit the line of genealogy to David. But then he's also pointed us beyond. And we would look beyond because what we have seen in this book is the Lord, haven't we? The Lord is sovereign over all things, working all things for good. And he is kind. And so if the book raises our hopes of a future of meaning, of lasting significance, well, surely if the Lord is sovereign and kind, he will find a way. And so it spurs us on, doesn't it, to look down this genealogy not just to David, but then as the Old Testament continues, there are lots more genealogies. They're telling us, keep paying attention. God is still at work bringing about all that he has promised and intimated. Keep paying attention. And that then, of course, brings us to the beginning of Matthew's gospel. Do turn to Matthew, familiar to a number of us from our Bible studies. But let's um, just pick out, if you like, some of the expectation that the book of Ruth has generated in us and see how Matthew speaks to it. So the opening line of Matthew's gospel, we are on page 973. The opening line, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So first of all, son of Abraham. Do you remember those promises to Abraham, which we've seen glimmers of fulfillment in Ruth the Moabite? Well, they are about to come to glorious fruition because here is the son of David, the one we've been waiting for. And then Matthew starts with this genealogy. And there we find Tamar and Ruth and Boaz, their names live on. And then Matthew tells us also of the miraculous birth of a baby. And it's quickly emphasized his name matters. In fact, even before he's born, God's angel tells him, tells us not of just one, but two of his names. Look in verse 21. You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Then verse 23, they shall call him Emmanuel, that name which means God with us. Think of this as the Ruth 3 stage. What I mean by that is we've now been presented with God coming in Jesus, wanting to save, wanting to redeem his people. Just like Boaz, if you like, in Ruth chapter 3, wanted to redeem Ruth and the family. But as with Boaz, so in Matthew, it is not straightforward. There are requirements that have to be discharged publicly. There needs to be a costly redemption. And so we read on, the baby grows up, he preaches, he performs mighty acts, and he draws the crowds. But we know the Jewish leaders aren't happy. And by chapter 12, we find them conspiring to destroy him. Is the mission destined to fail? Well, look on to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew responds at this point by inserting for us some words from the prophet Isaiah. So Matthew 12, and look to the end of that prophecy in verse 21, which tells us, And in his name, 
the Gentiles, that is the nations, will hope. So all around us today, there are people on there trying to make a name for themselves. They are trying to find meaning and significance in life now and for the future. In all sorts of ways, they're trying to ensure their own legacy. But it won't work. It just can't deliver. Probably not in this life, but certainly not beyond. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. This is the name that really matters. Because Jesus' name is what counts not only for Israel, but for the nations. And we are told he will bring hope. Now, please don't think wishy-washy hope. Hope for the best kind of hope. Not even hope for a better life now by the world's measure. This is hope, if you like, with a capital H. This is meaningful hope. Hope for true life, hope that will last beyond death, hope for an inheritance into eternity. It's what the book of Ruth always had in view ultimately, but here is the one, here is the name that can deliver that hope. But how will he do it? Well, Ruth chapter 4 has prepared the way, so we know what we expect to see. So let's see it, Matthew chapter 20. Matthew 20, verse 28, where Jesus himself says, Even as the Son of Man, that is Jesus, came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. So yes, Jesus' opponents would succeed in destroying him. But in fact, that, of course, was the outworking of the sovereign purpose of God, bringing about his kind purposes. Here we are seeing this costly redemption. And the ransom price is nothing less than the life of the Son of God poured out for many from every nation. And so what's the outcome? Let's turn on to chapter 28. Jesus rose again from the dead. And let's listen again to what he says to his disciples. Matthew 28, verse 18. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Well, here it is, the good news for all the nations, for the Moabite, for the Welsh, for your nationality, that a costly redemption has been paid and that all who believe are then baptized, we are told, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is, when we trust in this Christ as our Redeemer, we take on his name. This name which has all authority in heaven and on earth. The name that has defeated death and brought life and immortality to light. And so therefore, as we are baptized in his name, all that is his is now ours. His inheritance is our inheritance forever. Do you remember how we saw Naomi was seeking rest for Ruth? Well, now rest is what Jesus gives to his people. This fullness of life beyond our imaginings, ours with Jesus forever. I'll lead us in a prayer as we close. The psalmist writes, How precious is your steadfast love, O God! The children of mankind take refuge in the shadow of your wings. Our Father, we do praise you that you are at work in all things, 
according to your steadfast love. Thank you that in Christ the price has been paid for our redemption. And so we praise you for the refuge that we find in the shadow of your wings, now and forever. Blessed be your name. Amen.